Okay, so now we're going to talk about some complications of pregnancy. And we're talking specifically about complications that are related to pre existing conditions. Um, the very first thing I want to talk about is diabetes. And even though this is about pre existing conditions, diabetes can be either pre existing or it can be a a gestational complication. So this kind of straddles that um, divide a little bit. So quick review of the patho of diabetes. Uh, diabetes is mellitus, diabetes mellitus is the deficiency or absence of insulin production and or tissues become insulin resistant. So we either stop making insulin or we're making less insulin and our tissues don't like to take in the insulin. Glucose cannot get into the cells for energy. Remember that the purpose of insulin is to get insulin into the cell or glucose into the cells. So if glucose can't get into the cells for energy, the person is hungry, polyphagia. They're hungry because they can't get energy into their cells. Their cells think they're starving. They may have weight loss. Sometimes with that um, insulin resistance, they actually have weight gain, but type one, we're gonna have weight loss. The cells require some alternate energy source. Um, so we can have a breakdown of fats, which causes ketosis and acidosis. We can have a breakdown of proteins, which causes muscle wasting. So one problem is glucose can't get into the cells. Another problem is the sugar stays in the bloodstream. So the sugar that needs to be in the cells for energy, the cells are dying because they're not getting energy, but the sugar that's in the bloodstream is actually causing problems. That hyperosmolarity actually causes the kidneys to say, we've got to get rid of some of this. And so the glucose spills out into the urine, that's glycosuria. And when the glucose goes in the urine, the water goes with it. So they lose a lot of uh, water through the urine. They get dehydrated. When they get dehydrated, they're thirsty. The third problem we have with, um, that's polydipsia. The third problem we have with, um, glucose being unable to get into the cells, um, that glucose that's sitting in the bloodstream actually likes to bind to things. It actually binds to hemoglobin when red blood cells are formed. So when every day your body puts out some new red blood cells and a certain percentage of, of those are going to have glucose bound to them. And what percentage that is depends on the blood glucose level at that time. Okay, so glycosylation. So we actually use that to measure um, glucose control over the past several months, over the past couple of months. So it binds to hemoglobin, uh, but it also binds to the walls of the blood vessels. And we get microvascular damage first, which is the tiny vessels start to get damaged because of, of um, and so we start, we start to get, um, have problems in tissues that are fed by the tiny vessels. So microvascular damage, we're gonna see first in the kidneys and the eyes. Eventually it starts to be enough damage to the large vessels that we start seeing things like heart attack, stroke. Um, so we, um, uh, hardening of the arteries, things like that. We start to see problems because those artery, the larger vessels have been damaged. We also, glucose also binds to the nerves. And so glucose binding to the nerves and the nerves not getting adequate blood flow because of the glucose binding in those blood vessels causes nerve damage. So then we have nerve pain. Okay. So that's basic quick and dirty patho. If you don't remember the pathophysiology of diabetes, go back and refresh it. You're going to need that information. Diabetes is classified as type 1, type 2, and then there are some other types, um, but type 1 and type 2 are the most common. Type 1 is thought to be an autoimmune process. The islet cells on the pancreas just quit. They stop functioning. There is an absolute absence of insulin. So someone with type 1 diabetes makes zero insulin. That means they're more likely to develop ketosis. They're more likely to develop diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, so they're more likely because they can't get any energy into their cells at all, they're more likely to start breaking down fats for energy. Type two is more prevalent. It's a combination of decreased insulin production and increased tissue resistance to insulin. So because we can get some insulin that will get glucose into the cells, they're less likely to break down fats. So they're less likely to get ketotic. They can develop a syndrome called HHNS, hyperosmolar, hyper hyperglycemic hyperosmolar non-ketotic state. 
Um, they get very, very, very dehydrated, but they don't get ketotic. Um, it is possible for someone with type 2 diabetes to develop ketosis. It is less likely. Type 2 is associated with a genetic predisposition and also with obesity and with um, sedentary lifestyle, uh, excess consumption of um, simple carbs. It has a more gradual onset, but the same symptoms as type 1 diabetes typically. There's some other specific types that can be caused by disease or injury to the pancreas or genetic defects. Now, gestational diabetes is a separate type, but it is very closely related to type 2. Um, it's glucose intolerance with the onset or first occurrence in pregnancy. pregnancy. So someone who was not previously diabetic develops glucose intolerance. Um, they develop some insulin resistance um, and they start to have high blood sugars in pregnancy. The pathophysiology is very similar to type 2. Um, and actually people who've had gestational diabetes are at higher risk for developing type 2 diabetes later in life. We're going to come back in the next section and talk about some of the changes in pregnancy that can trigger someone who has just enough insulin sensitivity um, to move into, into uh, gestational diabetes.